Welcome, everyone. We have a special format for tonight's class, and I'm going to read it here for you as well, so stay with me. On the last Wednesday from now on of each month, Guy will be hosting Deep Dive Wednesday. That's tonight. And over the last few weeks, we've asked you, our viewers, and you here in the room as well, to send us any of Guy's writings or materials that you wish for him to explore and explain more deeply. Hmm? Any of the old masters, hmm. not just mine, any of the old masters, New Testament, Old Testament, any of the old masters suitable for this process. Oh, great. Okay. So we, we did get many of you responding, and we've compiled a list of questions that Guy will actually address during the talk portion of tonight's class. That's kind of the format. After... Uh, be around 60 minutes. We'll take a short break as usual and come back for our open Q&A with Guy. So as you're listening to all this and you have further questions, feel free to join in. If you're on GoToWebinar, you can talk directly to Guy or you can uh, write a question into the chat box or question box. Same place if you have any technical uh, problems online. Kate is back there ready to help. <laughs> <laughs> One man band. <laughs> All right, if you're in the room, first of all, do you know that you're in the room? If you know that you're in the room and you have a cell phone, turn it off. Now's the time to do that. All right, I'm going to read tonight's topic and key lesson. Here's our topic to see or not to see. And the key lesson reads new. True self-knowledge reorders the way it reorders the world we see because for one thing, the way we experience each moment of life is inseparable from how we understand it. So that just as a fractured mirror can only reflect back an image that seems shattered, so is it true that a divided mind can't see what is holy. Let's leave that up for a moment, please. We're going to have on our last Wednesdays for a while, and we're just going to stumble our way through it uh, tonight, probably for another couple months. The best way to bring in this new System, this new presentation, so that we can, in taking this deeper dive into things that have grabbed our interest. I don't know about you, I can remember so many incredibly distinct impressions that I had and that I continue to have. Because you can go back and look at something that you've read or heard. And then suddenly it's an altogether new ball game for you. Like suddenly that impression has grown much deeper than it was before. Now has the impression grown deeper? Or is there something in you that is more receptive and willing to allow that impression to reveal to you the very reason that you received it the first time you did, the attraction that followed it, and then how you were drawn to discover more and more about that same impression through the pursuit of whatever those ideas were that first gathered your attention. So we're going to, on the last Wednesday, we're going to, as Doug said, have these individual deep dives into the material that you are invited to submit over to Kate and Chris through the website. And I want to strengthen this idea of the key lesson that I wrote because it is really the heart and soul of everything that you're going to not just do this evening with me, but in the end, everything depends upon you understanding that new true self-knowledge reorders the world that you see. You see the world through the order of your mind. What you don't understand right now is that the order of your mind is the world's order. 
so that you see everything through eyes that justify whatever it is that you see for or against and never question that if I really understood what I see, why do I suffer over it the way I do? Or why am I ambitious like I am if I see the truth of something? The truth creates stillness. Not, not, not anger, not agitation. And that's a good tell of whether or not you have had an impression that quiets the mind and that fills the heart. Or whether you have been given an impression from associations that your own conditioned mind brings up and that it agitates because there's more and more conflict in trying to figure out what to do with what you just thought about. So my intention tonight, I have separated the first three or four, if I get that far, I do not know how far I'll get, of the submissions that you gave. I will do the best I can to move through them. And what I don't cover, I will cover in subsequent times, and perhaps not even on a deep Wednesday. Maybe we'll look at it in a way that we can discover something together. But here's two quick, very important little stories to set the stage. Would that I could tell these stories every time we have Deep Dive Wednesday. First, here's an assistant who has worked for 25 years with a a well-known oceanographer. And the assistant has always marveled at how this particular oceanographer never seems to, like he does, get weary of going down to the beach, getting on the boats, going out to sea. Because to him, because he doesn't understand what it means to dive deep into something, he's just doing the same thing. But he can see that she's different, and she's as, he is as tr- attracted to, to her energy because he sees that she sees something that he doesn't see. So one day he says to her, you know what, I, I wish that I was like you. I mean, you stay so th- enthused, involved in your work. What is it that you keep seeing that keeps you so enthused about the ocean? I mean, how many times can you go in the water? And she said, well, the truth is that whenever I feel something like what you're feeling now, disenchanted, do you ever feel disenchanted? Do you ever feel disenchanted? She said, whenever that happens, I just gather myself up and I decide I'm going to dive a little bit deeper than I did before and I'm going to remain in those depths, testing them until I see what waits for me there. You quit too easily. You take your reaction to what you imagine you should have revealed to you that you don't see yet and you believe that that's the totality of your experience in the waters of spirit. And they're not. You must understand that. And you will understand it a little bit deeper with the second story and I, I would, I, when I was working on this this afternoon, I thought, you know, I could probably just give the whole talk on this one little story. So here's a, a monk. He's a, a clever monk. And this clever monk is a lot like Tom Sawyer. Now, most of us don't know Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain, brilliant, obviously somewhat astute, awake man, wrote a story about these characters on the Mississippi. And Tom Sawyer and his relationship with Huck Finn was quite unique because uh, Huckleberry was kind of a a, a, a foil. Is that the right word that I want? Was in a constant play of psychological relationship with Tom Sawyer. It was never spelled out that way, but that was what was so intriguing about their relationship. So there's this story that Tom Sawyer has been asked by Aunt May... Is that her name? By his, what? That's close, Polly, Aunt Polly, to whitewash the fence. And so he's out there and he doesn't want to whitewash the fence. He wants to go fishing for catfish and jump in the mud holes and stuff. But he, he, he has a clever mind and so he's doing it. And he, he's, he, Huckleberry walks by and Tom, 
This is the greatest thing in the world. I love whitewashing the fence. And Huckleberry goes, what is it? He said, oh, man, don't ask. This is, uh, don't even ask if you can help me. <laughs> don't even ask. Because this is like, this brings joy into my heart. And the, and what's Huckleberry thinking? God, don't ask. Joy. Come on, let me help. <laughs> now, okay, so I guess better another 20 minutes. So this monk had the same smarts as Tom Sawyer. And so they're out there working in the fields, these monks, and he's sitting there, and part of their work is to make sure that the trenches for the irrigation for the crops are open. And he's sitting there, and he doesn't want to work in the heat, and he doesn't want to do the work, but he's thinking to himself, you know, I wonder if I can get it. And so he starts whistling and doing this, and somebody comes, what are you so happy about? Well, I don't know what the, the ground is that you're working on, but the ground I'm working on, every time I make a little hole, it makes this beautiful smell, it lightens my spirit. This is the great, I want to stay out here all day. Don't ask if you can have my spot. So the monk says, let me have your spot. All right, only because I really care about you. What a world. So he sits there and he watches the monk do his work. But he doesn't know that the master's watching him watch the monk that he tricked into doing his work. So that night, round about five, when they're all called in for their supper, all the monks are seated along these long tables and each has a bowl into which their uh, food is poured. And the man walks around and he's putting the food in the bowls. And when he gets to the Tom Sawyer-like monk, he just passes him by. Goes all the way around and comes to the man sitting across from the Tom Sawyer-like monk, who is the guy he tricked into doing the work. And instead of one serving, he gives that monk two servings. Wow. Well, can you imagine what's going through the mind? And he says, well, where's, what, where's my food? And he says... Look, I'm just doing what I'm told. The master told me that you're not to have any food tonight and that the man who's sitting across from you was to have your portion. Well, he starts, you know, you're eating in silence and suddenly he lets go of this big blast. And he goes, I'm going to go talk to the master. Mistake. He runs up to the master. He says, I don't understand what's going on. Why did you instruct them not to serve me and instead serve that man across from me two servings? Now Listen. The master says, the one who does the work of others receives the food of the ones who do not do their share of work. You mustn't think because you're clever or because you feel all of this trust and so-called good feelings about the work or about what I teach. You mustn't for a split second believe that that's the same as working in the trench doing the work that you're required to do. You're always looking for a way around what needs to be done. And as long as you're looking for a way to escape what is asked of you, not by this school or this teacher, but by that which has been stirred in you and brought you to this place, as long as you do that, you don't get the food. The others get it. And don't mistake this. I'm telling you that's the truth. And if you want to know why you see some people grow and not others, because those who are growing are doing the work. And the work is always to go deeper and deeper into what you do not want to see and know. Because if you will go deeper and deeper into that which calls you, you don't want to know something about this, this unconscious nature. I want to dive deeper into it, which is why we have Deep Wednesdays now. But the minute that you draw close to seeing what it is that you have asked to be tested by, I'm gone. And that's exactly the moment when you need to double down. That's when you need to find out whether or not what you believe, listen, is true about you in that moment and the moment you're in. That's where you need to find out for yourself and not because this man or any other man or woman says so. What a mistake you make to believe in the teacher. You mustn't believe in anyone or anything. You mustn't. It takes years and years and years to discover that until you see for yourself, you can't be yourself. 
Until you see for yourself, you cannot be yourself. And the whole of this work is about being yourself. Because your true self is already related to that which is divine and that which you seek. Don't seek it elsewhere. Fifteen minutes. Too many minutes gone by. Nice deep breath. Let's get going, okay? Uh, Okay, let's bring up the first of the writings that I was asked to go deeper into. Here it is. I, I don't see it. There it is. Thank you. So this came in. I have difficulty understanding the concept of singularity. I greatly appreciate recent discussions describing how we are observers of both a mountain and its reflection in an adjacent lake. And this has helped me gain a better out, outline of the idea. Is there something similar that would show the singularity of more disparate items? Since the mountain and the reflection are both beautiful, I get a bit lost when trying to observe that singularity between personal opposites, things that seem beautiful or wanted with ugly or unwanted. Is that the end of that? Do you understand what the person is asking? Can be confusing, can't it? Even though we spent years now talking about the observer is the observed and how the opposites are complementary. So, nice deep breath. Let's bring up the second key lesson for tonight. I can't tell you how important it is for you to understand this. And those at home, you can download it. You can write it down. It says... We believe that what we see is the cause of our experience when the truth is discernibly otherwise. It is how we experience each moment, i.e. our reaction to it, that determines not just how we see it, but what we see as its cause accordingly. Hopefully your minds are facile enough to understand that. We believe the cause of our experience is this idiot that I'm talking to. The cause of this unwanted reaction I'm having is because of the way you're talking. The cause of my irritation is because the world is so stupid and stubborn and selfish. So that I believe that the thing I see causes my experience. Do I not? And because I believe that the thing I see causes my experience, what do I spend all of my time doing? Trying to change what I see. Now, it should be pretty clear at this point How many of you have tried to change everyone and everything that you see that you disagree with? And is it changing things? Or is it exacerbating the frustration that you feel when fools who don't know what you do can't see the great wisdom of your expertise in changing them? Yes? So, first, we believe what we see is the cause of our experience. That's not true. It is how we experience the moment that determines how we see it. It is reversed. The inner determines the outer, not the outer determines the inner. That's the meaning of it. So that when I look out and I see Roger, and who wants to look at Roger? (laughs) I look at Roger, and let's say he's kind of frowning or he's not happy, or he's in thought someplace, not really here, caught up in some other movement. Now, you look at people, and they're not engaged in what you're doing. Uh, how do you feel towards them? Yeah, yeah I'm going to show you engagement. I, I, want you, I want you to pay attention to me. I want you to listen. And don't, don't do anything other than that, yes or no. So that my experience in that moment is the problem's Roger. But what I see in that moment is the result of the experience that I don't see unfolding within me in that moment. And the experience I don't see is that I'm everywhere and anywhere with anyone and everything with demands, with expectations, with wants and not wants that go before me to give me the experience I have when I don't get what I want and how great it is when I do get what I want. Everybody following? This is such an important idea. I can't stress it strongly enough. So now to this person, he says, well, I, you know, I kind of like the old idea. See a mountain reflected in a lake? I'm, I want to go see that someplace. And we discussed, when we talked about how the mountain is reflected in the still waters, we discussed, you and I, that the mountain and the still waters 
are in turn reflected in the man's consciousness and the woman's consciousness, and that it is the experience of the reflection of these opposites that brings that person into a completely different relationship with that moment, where now the observer of the opposites has taken the opposites, meaning that which is above and below, brought them into a place where the whole thing is reflected in that person's consciousness, and he realizes himself as the instrument, as the mirror of what he or she is looking at. Please, this is a deep dive. So, with that in mind, still working on this idea of mountain and lake, how wonderful that is. Let's say that what you see, just for grins, isn't the beautiful white cap mountain reflected in a nice quiet lake, but rather the mountain that you see is this unwanted moment looming before you, rising up before you. You know, you drive up to a mountain, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So there you are, and this, this mountain is getting bigger and bigger, and you know it's getting bigger and bigger because you're becoming more and more agitated, more and more afraid, yes or no? So I look out at this mountain, the way you're looking at me, what I know about my health, my finance, you, you fill in the blank. I look at it, and as I look at this mountain, and it's getting closer, what's going on inside of me? I'm becoming more agitated, am I not? How am I going to get over that? I'm going to get past this moment, because the closer it seems to get, this is such a great, the closer it seems to get, the worse it seems to be. See, the moment isn't getting closer to you. You you really believe that the moment is coming. No moment comes. What you're experiencing is a consciousness that has made something out of an impression, an active force, and then in making that mountain out of what? Out of what your mind tells you it means then the more you define what that mountain is, the more you are confined by the fear you have to it. Can you see that? So here's exactly what it means that this person is asked. I get it when it comes to beautiful things. I don't get it when it comes to stuff I don't want. I'm explaining to you how the opposites are not um, uh, in conflict Complimentary. Is there a right hand without a left hand? A yin without a yang, a light without a darkness, yes or no? So if one doesn't exist without the other, and none do, are they separate? So when my mind makes something of an experience, and I see the experience that my mind has made, is the moment the mind making different than the mind that has made it that way? Is it? It is not. It is a singularity. What it means to dive deep in this instance is to start to understand that this suffering, this fear we experience in these moments is because when we've had the impression, okay, let's see. I'm sitting at home, the phone rings, it's the doc, the doctor. Now, the older you get, the more you don't want to call from your doctor, just to be clear. Now, just the fact that the phone rang and I see it's Dr. Schmendricks, what happens inside of me? Do I go, oh, I love talking to Dr. Schmendricks. I'm so glad that she called, yes or no? What happened inside of you? What if you didn't know that the doctor retired and became an insurance agent and you just were awarded $4 million? You can always wish. No. The mind only knows how to look at what impresses itself on it from the conditioning it has had in all corresponding relationships. That's all it knows to do. So that the experience of the moment isn't because of what I see, but rather this experience that is awakened in me, born of resisting anything that even looks resentful, uh, uh, res- worth resisting, instantaneously tells me what I see. And then what do I do when I think I see what's going on? I don't answer the phone. 
or I answer with my heart pounding, sure that something has gone wrong. And then once I'm in the hands of what I see inwardly, what happens to me after that? Does it go up or down? Does it go up or down? The moment I fear doesn't exist apart from a level of consciousness that has interpreted the meaning of that moment. And there is no moment separate from any other apart from what this mind makes of it as it makes into whatever it needs to, to do what? To give me this sense of self. And that's, that's the deep dive if you really start to say, why, why does my mind go there? Is there a lot of places your mind could go? Well, where does it go in those moments when you see something that you don't want? Where does it go? Happy place? No, it goes into instantaneous resistance. And out of instantaneous resistance, the absolute failure to see, a whole subject coming up in a later talk, there is no resistance without insistence prior to the moment that stirs it. There is no resistance without unseen insistence in that consciousness before it is stirred by that moment. Which means that what I'm resisting cannot be separated from the insistence that it shouldn't be that way. Please, yes or no? So are they separate the way the mind sees it? Or is the observer the observed in that moment not knowing that he or she is in fact inseparable from the way they see that experience and then that experience becomes my being? Please? Okay, that's the first one. Number two, let's bring it up. When I'm done with this one, I should say, because at some point I really want to... Uh, we're not set up in the room yet the way I want to do it for this, but I, at some point I'm going to ask you what, do you, what do you think about this? How do you see it? Is there a de- have you seen this more deeply? Because then we can be engaged like we do on our Wednesday discoveries, and then you, in your sharing, can do what? Deepen the impression you have and help others realize, you know what, I didn't see it that way either. Oh, I didn't see it like that. Isn't that something? So many ways to see something, and when it is true, everyone gets to see what is new inside of themselves. Number two, I'll read it to you. It's uh, a comment that came in about the book, uh, my book, Apprentice of the Heart. It was the piece in Apprentice of the Heart was called The Way It Is. And for those who have no idea what that book is about, it was a book that longest, took the longest time of any book I've ever written. It took a full seven years to write Apprentice of the Heart because it was a, a process that began of what can only be called a, uh, a kind of a dialogue between myself and the divine, between a longing that I had for the divine And what as I would dive deeper and deeper into that longing to understand how could one have such a longing and not know what one longed for out of that deep dive impression after impression was produced. And this book is filled with the impressions of this man who went through this process of longing for the divine and not understanding why it seemed like the divine would be there and not there understood. That's the book, Apprentice of the Heart. So this is the piece from it. It says, I saw you today. What amazes me most within each of these two brief visits is how being with you always shows me another of the mistaken ideas I have and hold about myself. For example, in times when neither you nor my heart are anywhere in sight, it feels to me as if I don't possess a thing. This sense of inner poverty can be so pervasive that I no longer care that I'm this close to never caring about anything again, let alone despairing that both you and my heart are missing. My certainty is almost settled, and then you appear. Can you get the drift of that? 
here's a man or a woman, in this case it, it was me, who on one hand, and I can say this with honesty, really from a certain age never wanted anything other than to know something of the cosmos, the celestial nature, the divine, the Christ, the nature of love. And so after so many years, I don't know how old I was. We were here in Ojai, right? I don't mean in, we were here in Southern Oregon when I wrote this, yeah. So probably in my 50s. I'm talking to my wife because I don't remember anything. She tells me everything I need to know. (laughs) Because things had started to open up, I would have moments where it was evident that there was this abiding love and this beauty. And then it would seem that this abiding love and this beauty would just pick up its take the football and leave the stadium, pack up its tent and go. And it would just drive me in crazy, failing to understand what I hope to explain to you and what this person is asking me so that they might understand a similar situation in their life. Is this, everybody understands the situation, yeah? So let me start by saying this. The awareness of the absence of something is the proof of its existence. The awareness of the absence of something is the proof of its existence. For instance, if you go into a room, how do you know it's dark? Because you see the light is missing. You you don't see the darkness. You know you're in the darkness because the light isn't there. Please, do you see that with me? So even though I can't see the light, I know the light exists. How do I know? Because I'm in the dark. Please? I don't know if any of you have, have been dragged down by any of the, the numerous uh, flus and blues floating around this world today, but you get sick and you go down for a long time. I can tell you at a certain point, you finally start to notice and long for the health you didn't even know when you had it. God, I didn't know I was healthy, but I sure know I'm not healthy now. So the absence of my health proves that there is health. I just don't have it. But if you can understand light and darkness and health and illness, you can understand that these are, in fact, opposites, aren't they? And if you start to understand that everything moves as it does in constant circles, waves, then you start to realize everything comes and goes. And just because something goes doesn't mean it's not still there. What's not there in that moment is your capacity to be aware of it because you haven't developed that well enough yet in yourself to understand that the absence of something doesn't mean it's gone. It just means that momentarily you are in a relationship with that moment in such a way that you're actually being asked to realize that, you know what, there is another level of this. So that when you start to realize that in this moment of absolute seeming dryness or emptiness, which you have to go through, you have to go through a dry heart. You have to go through the desert of this emptiness. It's impossible. In order to do what? To lose interest in the you that's lost in the emptiness and the dryness because when you're there, you're no longer attending to the light, the health, and the, and the spirit that's always there, but you're not because you're looking for what you knew. You're looking for what you want, not for what you're being given. And you're always being given the presence of everything you need to look more deeply into a consciousness that only knows how to look in the opposites, meaning that only knows to search for what it had become identified with and then believe that what it's identified with is the same as being in that ecstasy, in that state of higher consciousness. Do you follow me? Do you follow me? It's a phenomena. Opposite, 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 opposite. I'm so dry. 
I'm dead. What's wrong with me? Oh, thank God you're here. Thank thank you for this grace. Beautiful. I love it. Please never leave me. Oh, where did you go? (laughs) Come back. What do I love in that moment? Sense of myself. That's what I love. And our blessed Father, the Almighty, whatever you want to call it, allows for this movement so that you, through awareness of the opposites, can begin to bridge the consciousness that seeks itself but calls itself looking for the source of love. It's not. And you have to be purified of that. So that there is a relationship where there is this, um, what do I want to use? Uh, There is this, uh, a bridge. Yeah, a bridge. When the opposites are bridged, there is no longer a self that knows itself through any one of them. And only awareness can bridge the opposites because it can see both of them at the same time. Is this too deep? That's why the work always talks about being a bridge. Because the bridge between heaven and earth, the bridge between left and right, the bridge between yes and no, those those are arbitrary, conditioned ideas that we meet life through, the knowledge of good and evil, and then when they are bridged and one sees that neither exists without the other and that you are the embodiment of both at all times, then you no longer want one and don't want the other or don't want this and only want that. Your mind is no longer that toy being beat back and forth like some kind of, uh, what do they call those things when people play the uh, wiffle ball or not pickleball, <laughs> badminton. Thank you. Badminton, not ping pong. (laughs) Badminton is a stupid little bird that flies back and forth. What's the problem? Bad Bad person, Terry. (laughs) Can you grasp what I'm saying? Now, how am I ever going to fall out of love with myself until I see that what I think I love really isn't what I believe it is? Because what I love is the continuing experience of myself as somebody in love with God, seeking the divine, but he's ignoring me. God can't ignore you. <laughs> it's impossible. If, if, God, if, if God ignored me, no, even if I died right on the spot, he, I'm still not ignored. Let me go on to the third of the special right the, the of the writings that we're examining. How am I doing on time? It says I would. Oh, this is also from Apprentice, huh? Yeah. Huh. Go figure. Mm-hmm. I would like Guy to read his poem from Apprentice of the Heart, entitled "Always You," and to share any reflections that may arise now as he dives deeper into this special writing. It was a piece that I. Uh, put into this book, I, I guess. I didn't know where it was. Called Always You. I'll read it and then we'll look at it together. Before I dream, may I hope for you. Before I long, may I reach for you. Before I judge, may I listen to you. Before I rush, may I rest in you. Before I shout, may I call on you. Before I doubt, may I hear from you. Before I brag, may I point to you. Before I fear, may I trust in you. Before I act, may I remember you so that in these things and all I do, it is not me that is first, but always you. I don't know why it takes as many years, perhaps lifetimes, to understand that there is no substitute for any real need.
There is no substitute for any real need. We think that we know what we need, don't you? I need to have more of this, I need less of that, I need to fix this, I need to get away from that. I need more time to myself. I need you to no longer be you. I need more money. I need to shed some weight. I need uh, another face. Some of us do. And I don't know why it, it, it is the way it is. it is. It just is, you know, just slow on the uptake is this consciousness. It just is. Because if, if the world that we know and experience, if it could give me what I need then upon receiving what I need, the purpose of that need would be fulfilled. But what I say I need and the purpose that it creates in my life and the ambition required to pursue it may or may not bring me what I need, but without any question, what I need certainly gives way to another need because whatever it was either got lost or was insufficient to answer what I thought that need could be answered by. Get people to love you. Get people to respect you. Get some more dough in the bank. Be more secure. Do this, do that. It endless. It is literally endless. But by the grace of God, if anyone is willing to see it, at some point you realize... I'm getting ready to go after what I believe I need so that I can be free of this disturbance that I feel born of not having what I'm supposed to do and be. Yes or no? And how long does that go on? Can anybody free themselves from that? If I am the one, this consciousness that is creating and pursuing the images, the graven images, I might add. God said, let there be no graven images. Why? Because the minute the mind comes up with an image, what happens to it? The image that it comes up with, it's already identified with or it wouldn't create the image. So the identity and the image are a singularity, aren't they? But do they seem to that mind a singularity? Or is the image that I'm going to pursue quite separate from the self that's imagined it because I'm going to get it and then I won't have to imagine it anymore? It's extraordinary. And then only by the grace of God... A person starts to get weary of life, not bitter, not broken by it, not angry at it, not depressed because of it, but something just begins to fall away. And what starts to fall away is the certainty that what I have to do and where I have to go and what I have to fix and what I've got to rush through, that that's absolutely necessary. And that just starts to, like leaves on some tree, a great autumnal experience in the season of one's life. The leaves start to fall away and fall away and fall away. And as they do, that person begins to understand what can only be understood as the leaves that are created by that unconscious nature begin to fall away. Not because you're trying to make them fall away. You see, that's one of the problems. You want... You want everything to fall away from you because you think you know what has to fall away. You don't know what has to fall away. No one thing has to fall away. That's an illusion. What has to fall away is the whole of this identity because it is the maker and it is made by each subsequent image that it creates. It has to fall away. Who, how am I going to make it fall away? Can you make yourself fall away? Doug? Barbara, can you make Doug fall away? You're trying, yeah, I know. <laughs> and by the way, the more any of you try to make anyone or anything fall away, the more crystallized it becomes. So as it falls away, and I'm, uh, this is a little bit of a, I'm tipping my hat to this coming 
Sunday's Easter talk. Yeah. There is an unknown place in the soul where it is infused with the light of life infinitely. An unknown place in the soul that never stops being infused with life-giving, love-providing light. Never stops. You know the cross that we're going to talk about on Sunday? The heart of the cross? That is where what is everlasting, timeless, perfect love flows into this nature, this physical nature in passing time. And where it flows into that line of passing time, it infuses everything that it touches with an impression. And out of that impression, an awareness. And out of that awareness, a rebirth. So what you need, you already have been given. That's why so many of the the old masters talk about, I make this great journey and then suddenly I find myself right back where I started from. Which is so irritating when you first hear it, isn't it? Sounds great. Yeah, I want to be right back where I started from. But I don't know where I started from. Because I always have a new starting place depending on what the desire of the moment is. Please? (laughs) So at a certain point, with this poem before I dream may I hope for you, before I long may I reach for you, that each and every one of these things, this man who who is the instrument of this poem, he has understood to to whatever extent it's true. I've had enough of creating my life. Because nobody wants to hear this, and I know that you don't. Whatever this mind makes by itself is a miscreation. It's a miscreation because it has been made by something trying to make in its own image the life that it believes it requires to be realized. And this mind that sleep to itself without this infusion that is its life, it doesn't know about, uh, about real life and knows nothing about it at all. It knows the sensation of pursuing that which it believes it needs so that it avoids the emptiness and pursues the fullness, believing that the fullness it pursues is actually the same as real fullness. When, when it does that, vacillating from opposite to opposite, again, what is it filled with? Itself. Isn't it? I, I pursue what I believe is going to bring an end to this sense of being incomplete. This evening I was, uh, I worked... Uh, some days I work a lot more straight through maybe eight, ten hours at a time. Some days I don't. Today was one of those days because we're working on this new system and we're trying to get everything squared away. And so finally, um, my wife brought me a tamale, mm, a tamale, and I was done with the tamale and I had 15 minutes to not do anything. I know you think that's an exaggeration. It's not. And the minute that I had 15 minutes to not do something, what do you think this mind was telling me? Turn on the TV. Do this, do that, do something. Occupy yourself. That's what it was telling me. Where the whole time in the background it's going, oh, I wish I could just rest a little bit. I wish I could have sat back and relax. Oh, oh. It, it's a liar. It's a thief. It's, it says what it wants because it imagines in the moment of wanting it that what it wants can bring an end to its want. When what it wants is born out of an endless, insatiable appetite, mammon as Christ called it. And only as you see that do you as a man or a woman begin to realize that what I need, the only thing I need to answer this insatiable longing is to go deep enough into the consciousness that creates it and maintains it to understand that nothing this mind is ever going to give me to do or to be will bring an end to the need that God put in me to know his life as my own. What a, what a trip. One day you'll be on the, the 
your, your sour faces tell me you're on the wrong side of what I'm saying. But one day you'll be on the right side of this. You'll actually understand for yourself that there is something that unendingly is answering the longing that it put in you. It put the emptiness in you. It put the dry heart in you. Our task is to understand that connected to the emptiness is the fullness already. Can you separate the seasons? The spring, the summer, the fall, the winter? The bareness of the winter gives birth to the spring. And without the spring that is born in the same absence of that winter, what would there be? And do you do it? Are any of you the creator of the seasons? Ludicrous, isn't it? So I, I've run through the first three. We won't go to four, Kate. I won't have time. But let's summarize for a minute. Nice deep breath. Bring yourself back. Put up the very first key lesson, if you will. We come full circle. This is the extraordinary thing. When you, when you dive deep, listen, when you test the depth of experience, you must test the depth of your experience. Your experience now tells you that there's danger beneath this. There's freedom outside of it. So that we're all in favor of the experience of seeing the beautiful reflection of the mountain in the lake. I'm all for that because it fills me with something that I recognize obviously must be a reflection of something about myself. This is beautiful. You must tep test the depths of your exhaustion. You must test the depths of your fear. You must teps test the depth of everything. Why? So that you understand you can't drown. You can't lose yourself. You can only find yourself, but you lose yourself every time you refuse to test the depths of your experience. What happens when the mind is running crazy? You know, when the full moon comes, I'm the first to tell you, I'm not a fan of the full moon. It, it doesn't sit well with whoever that, whatever it is that lives in me. I don't sleep well when there's a full moon. I just don't. And it's not because of the light, because I pull the blinds down a full moon. It's not that. Something's agitated. Well, what happens when you're agitated? What do you do? What do you do when you're agitated? I do everything I can to avoid it. Don't avoid it. Why? So I can go into the depth of the consciousness that has the agitation. That I believe because of my reaction and the experience that's telling me this is the cause of it, I believe that I can deal with it. Aren't you always trying to deal with everything? Please, I'm asking you. Trying to deal with your relationships, deal with this problem, deal with this situation, yeah? You, there's no you to deal with the situation because the situation you're trying to deal with is a creation of your own unconscious mind. And the only way that whole thing can come to an end isn't by a getting here or getting away from there. It's to see the whole of the thing, that the opposites are not disconnected, that the experience of this life is really one grand infusion of a certain kind of energy that allowed to do what it has been given to us to do, bridges these opposites. Look, if all of my energy goes into trying to fix you, what happens to me? Come on. Let's say I get you to be what I want you to be. Is that the end of the story? No, because I'll always find something wrong with you. And if it's not you, I'll find somebody else that bothers me. Yes or no? <laughs> if it's not this group or that group or this, if it's not, so I'm going to be bugged. And I believe because of what I see that what I see is bugging me. What I see is not bugging me. 
What's bugging me is my consciousness that's bugged by everything that doesn't match up to what it says the moment should be. So I'm in one opposite or the other all the time. Vacillation, want, not want, yes, no. The incessant conflict of a mind set against itself. And one day when you have tested the depths of these opposites, you start to realize, I can't go there. And when I can't go there, I don't quite go there. I, can't qu- I don't quite go the other way, do I? And so these opposites that formerly were divided, they begin to grow closer and closer. And as they do, so does the agitation that they were always producing. And at some point, they collapse in on each other. And then you see. The whole purpose of that was to produce this new impression that has bridged the opposites and that brings you into an entirely different relationship with them. Deep dive, this part of the deep dive is over. You can retire your masks and snorkels and I'll see you when we come back from the break.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to get set for our Q&A in just a minute, but I do want to remind you of this Sunday, the Easter talk um, that's coming right up. And the topic, again, is Awaken the Indwelling Light of Christ, the journey beyond mind to the heart of the cross. Um, and as usual, this will be a free talk as part of our ongoing classes, and you're invited to join 9.30 a.m. Pacific on all of our platforms. Um, and you will get a you will get a reminder um, through our go to webinar. Uh, you you receive a, a reminder email on that. And Guy says that in this talk he'll be exploring the subject of rebirth in depth. And we have a way for you to immerse yourself even more in this topic uh, ahead of time if you wish. And we still have time. And so what happened was uh, some of the some of the students went through the archives and found three. Uh, talks um, that are Easter talks from over 20 years of talks guys given here. And so we created a three-part e-course and it's a great way for you guys to um, engage in that and also to give something back to us. It's basically a $10 donation and you get MP3s and full transcripts on all of that. And I can't encourage you enough to take advantage of this really uh, simple and uh, cost effective way to to get some wisdom you really can't get anywhere else so more information is on guyfinley.org slash easter you can make your donation anytime before the webinar and probably even on that day if you want to get those even then but go there now uh go guyfinley.org slash easter and make a ten dollar or more donation and you'll you'll get all of these um, great talks uh, to prepare ourselves for Sunday. So do take advantage of that. Also, if you want to make a donation anytime, you can go to guyfinley.org slash donate, and that helps us greatly. That's how we run the foundation. So thanks so much for all of you who, who regularly, regularly do help. Uh, so, and so now we're going to get started uh, with, with you guys. If you're on GoToWebinar, Now's the time to raise your hand if you have an impression, if you have something you want to ask, something a little further about what Guy discussed. Raise your hand by clicking on the little hand icon in the uh, control panel there at GoToWebinar. If you want to write a question, you can do it on the question box or the chat boxes of the different uh, platforms that you might be on. So we can do that now. So let's bring Guy in and we will see if he wants to say anything more. Guy? Okay, guy. We have Jill in the queue. We'll bring in Jill. Hi, guy. Hi, Jill. Hi. <clears throat> um. So, what you were talking about today? I feel like this was my day today. I woke up and I just didn't feel right. I just had this tape playing in my head about how my life wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. Yeah. And so this voice in my head all day was telling me it needed to go this way and it wasn't and on and on it went. And I was watching, although Part of me didn't want to watch, but I was watching and um, it continued and I sort of saw myself talking to people and telling them about my day and my pretty <laughs> party and um, I didn't want to be saying the things that I did, but I said them. And um, I sort of just watched that. I felt like I watched it play out. And um, I didn't like what I saw. Right. But it, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You know, and, you, you know what, Jill? Um, I wish it could have been different. Yeah, no, 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 I no, no. This. no no, be done with wishing things could be different and work at being deliberately present enough 
to catch the part of you that after it does what it does then says, I wish I hadn't done that. It's a trick. But I, 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 I'll share something with you, Jill. And uh, personally, I, I, I find it very encouraging. I wish that I had uh, at least had it intimated to me as true in my very early days. But there is this immense, in fact, it's so grand, it's, it's beyond seeing in one respect. Every human being believes that they're different than every other human being. And you're every human being. And every human being wishes they weren't the human being they are. And it's only when you can catch the temptation of resisting what you see that you can begin to start seeing the nature that doesn't want to be itself. You see, the nature that doesn't want to be itself doesn't want to be itself because it creates conflict in itself. And so it imagines as it creates this conflict that it can create a condition where that conflict isn't with it anymore. And then it identifies with the sensation of a time to come when it'll be free. And with every time it imagines that it will be free, it cements and creates the the, the depth and breadth of this conflict that it's unaware of. So that the, the task is to no longer have a wish to be free the way we do when we don't want to be what we're experiencing. The task is to, is to, as I said, test the depth of that moment. See, well, see I, I, I've never done anything other than, and no one has. The, the, any true teacher, the only difference between yourself and a true teacher is that that man or woman, however it was given to them to do and to be, they tested what you've yet to test. That's all it is. Because when you hear the truth that a man or woman who knows something of it tells you, you recognize it immediately. Why? Because the depth's in you. That's what makes the road so, so challenging in one respect and yet in the end so simple, Jill. One day I have to realize, you know what, I've, I've spent 50,000 years wishing that I didn't do what I just did. Wish I hadn't said this. Wishing I could have changed that. Wishing that my mind wasn't my mind. So that one day when that temptation comes to identify with that which says you should be this, not that, you understand that what you've imagined as being this doesn't exist without not that. They're one thing. And the clearer that becomes to you, the shorter the distance between the true intelligent action. Because you're no longer trying to sort things out now. You see things as they are being sorted out in this mind. And you're done with the the parlor game. And the last thing I'll say about that, Jill, is this. Is there more people waiting? Am I taking too long? Okay. Do you know why we don't test things? Like, for instance, I feel this, I feel like I'm kind of bare and dry and barren and I'm not happy. I don't want to be me today. I I don't want to have to do what I have to do today. Why do I have to do this? Why are they? You know why we don't learn from those moments? Can anybody tell me why? Because to to learn from that moment, I have to enter into the consciousness that's creating it. And why don't I want to enter into that consciousness that's creating it? Because it hurts to do that. It's painful to see. So that 
everything that we do to avoid a moment is born out of avoiding the suffering that is required of us to be able to see these opposites and transcend them. Everything. Anyway, Jill, hang in there. You don't know it. Maybe you suspect it. It isn't, it isn't that help is on the way. It's here. It's always here. What if you really knew that? That's what you need to find out. Anything else, uh, Douglas, Kate? Nope, zip. Um, uh, you talking to me or Kate? I wasn't uh, sure. Either or. Either or, okay. I have no one in the queue, Guy, and no written questions. We could ask the people in the room if anybody there would like to come up. We have one uh, victim, I mean volunteer. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Namita. Mm, I actually experimented with, uh, with this. Um, I think you gave a talk on impressions, and you demonstrated the mirror uh, technique. And um, I usually go for walks um, in the park. And when I go for the wa uh, my walks, there's, there's a house um, with three dogs. And th there's one big dog, one medium-sized dog, and one really small dog. And every time I pass by, uh, all the three dogs start barking. And the owner, uh, always uh, he's always yelling at the dogs, saying, like, stop barking, stop barking. And I always, every time I pass by, I always wonder, like, doesn't he see that, like, this is the nature of the dogs? Um, why does he, you know, why does he have to yell at the dogs? And then, uh, then instead of judging um, the owner, I thought I'll just see what it's teaching me. And I realized uh, that this is the nature of my mind. Um, and I keep doing the same thing all day. Barking. Right? Barking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the next time I passed by, um, I, um, I was like, okay, uh, let me try this because I learned from you that day that, um, so whatever you see is a mirror uh, of your own mind. So the next time I walked by, I, I, I thought that I'll just be still, absolutely still within myself as I walk by and see what happens and, and not determine what's going to happen this time. Just clear your mind, everything, all the memories, and, and just walk past the dogs again. And this time when I walked past, um, I was able to keep my mind still, and all the three dogs were there, and none of them barked. They all were just staring at me, walk past. Um, <laughs> Namita the dog whisperer. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so I tried this experiment a couple of times, and every time my my, my mind would, would you know uh, do a clutter, uh, the dogs would start barking <laughs> all over. And this was just an exper experiment to see uh, how it goes. That's a good experiment. Yeah. This the other thing that I uh, while I was driving down here, I was listening to one and Howard. I would talk about self dramatization. So just like what Jill was talking just now about, you know, like she wakes up in the morning and feels like nothing is going right. For me, it's been, uh, it's been, you know, uh, confusion, like questions and confusion that uh, that was or doom and gloom was a big one for me. So uh, now I see it that this is self-dramatization. This is where I get the sense of self from. And when I started really seeing this, uh, one day I was just, uh, had this feeling of being awake. As in I was seeing, but I was awake. So even when I close my eyes now, I feel like I'm awake. And when I keep my, when my eyes are open, I feel like I'm sleeping or something like that. Okay. <laughs> So, so yeah, so this is, uh, this is some new discoveries. That, Good. Yeah. Anything else? 
Uh, no, no one uh, in the queue and no written questions still, Guy. Okay. There's Sheila just popped into the queue. Let's try Sheila real quick here. Okay, I'm really nervous. Oh, don't. Um, I've talked once before. Yeah, don't be nervous, Sheila. Hi. 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 Um, I've been really, really sick. I'm 84 years old, and I read the report of of a scan that I had, a CAT scan. Uh -huh. And I thought everything was hunky dory. And I go into the doctor, and because it's all in Spanish, I didn't read it right. And he comes to tell me about all these things that are wrong with me. As well, I've developed bronchitis and an infection, and I've got gallstones in the wrong place. So here I thought I was healthy, and he explained what he's going to do, and I have a lot of confidence in him. I just love this doctor. Mm -hmm. And I said, have you done this procedure before? Maybe more than twice? He says, how about 500 times? So all of a sudden, it's okay. I'm 84, and I thought my life was maybe over, but maybe I've got another time to go. And um, I was the one that lost my husband of, after 63 and a half years of marriage, yes. and that's been almost... 16 months ago, but the day he died, um, I had the most calming experience, and I'm sure God was with me then. And I've always fought God. I, you know, I was raised in the church, and I went away from it, and I've been more interested in spiritual things. But that afternoon, I was so peaceful. I've never felt that way before or since. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, I woke up and had COVID. And I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, it just knocked me right for another loop. But I recovered from that. Yeah. So I think I'm not through yet. Um, no, you're, you're I not. I don't know why, you're not why I called. You're not through. I'm not through yet. No, but I feel like I'm getting some of the work. But I, I'm hard on myself, and I think I should get it all quickly because I'm 84. But yeah. <laughs> I've got many lifetimes ahead of me, I'm sure. Oh. And I'm tempted to tell you a, so imagine Sheila, everybody, uh, here's a, we're back in a monastery someplace and there's an anxious monk and the monk's anxious because every day he's got to do certain things. He's got to sweep, then he's got to help in the kitchen, then he's got to go to the field, then he's got to come back, he's got to help serve the food, pour the master's tea. And so every day he's anxious, and he's always going to the master and saying, you know what, when am I going to stop being anxious? I feel like I always have to, you know, just I'm always behind. The master says, let me ask you a question. Do you think you're going to pour my tea again tomorrow? No, of course. How about the day after tomorrow? Yes. And what about preparing the meal? Do you think you're going to do that tomorrow? Yeah, I am. How about the next day? Yes, of course. What about a week from now? Yes. You're driving me crazy. <laughs> master says, don't you see, you're never going to be done. So stop trying to be. You're always trying to be done. You're always trying to be done with what disturbance and this person and that. You're always trying to be done. And it hasn't dawned on you, I've been trying to get done. I've been rushing for 75 years, 84 years. I'm going to do this again. If it's not this Spanish doctor, it'll be a, 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 an Indian doctor. It'll be, I, I, I'm going to be somewhere and I'm going to have the same experience. Let me stop trying to get through it. Do it. Do it. That's... That's what we must do, Sheila. 
And we have to discover there's nothing in us that wants to be done. It wants to have something to rush through. It wants to have something to worry about. That's this nature. You're beginning to see, especially evidenced by that experience you had, there's another order of being where it's done, as Christ said. It's done. It's finished. So I go through the iteration of being present to an awareness that all of this is unfolding in. And when I'm there enough, I start to understand, this is what I do. This is what I do. This is what I do. I don't have to try to get through it. I need to do it. And the more I do it without trying to get through it, the more I learn about this consciousness that's always rushing to get done. This is connecting, Sheila. Yes, it is. Good. Yes, it is. Yeah. You're, yeah. In a, you're in a good spot. Yeah. I don't care how old you are. That doesn't exist. That's an illusion. I know. The body, we're all going to shed our bodies. The body, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's already happened. And the truth is, it has. That's the other thing. We don't understand time very well. It's already, I've already died. So let me go ahead and die here and now so that when the moment comes where the body goes, where it goes, I'm not worried about it because I died now. You do something completely, you die to the nature that believes it has to get it done so it can get on to do something else. Okay, Sheila, stay close and don't be nervous. We're pals. All right, guy, we do have a written question here that just came in. And it says at the beginning from the great raccoon, which we found out is actually Stanislav. So he says, or she, she, I think it's a he, if you'd be so kind, please send this to Mr. Finley. And he says, not exactly a question, more like a cry from the soul. I'm so tired of being afraid to follow my own path, constantly trying to find friends who will accompany me on it. Yes. Something they never want to do or demand something from me that I cannot give them halfway. Right. There's an incredible fear inside my soul that I'll be destroyed. I fear that if I walk alone, I'll never be able to return. And all the people around me whom I should start fighting for will see my flaws. I'm afraid that when it won't be only my fear that destroys me, but my loved ones will start doing that as well. I'm sorry, I'm not just reading this. It's first. fine. I'm getting it. I'm so tired. And this very small percentage of me takes a step towards fear and my freedom every day. Thanks for the knowledge, Guy. I always get lost, but I always come back. Stanislav. You know, when it feels like, and it does so often, that you're drowning, drowning, like it's the most irritating, agitating thing in the world for somebody to say, well, stop flailing around and just put your feet down. There's ground where you are. Because we're so sure that there's no ground where we are when we're feeling like that. All there is is the flailing. And what you're describing, if you'll excuse the marriage of these metaphors, it's like the dark night of a, so, of a sailor who falls overboard. Ship's gone, nobody there to comfort me, nobody there for me to call on, just this fear and this darkness. And yet I've got to struggle to stay, stay awake, stay floating, stay somehow, wait till I can get saved. And then Stanislav, what happens is that you realize that you're not going to be. 
and you give up. And when you give up, your feet go to the, the, to the, to the ground that was always there, right where you are, right where you are. And then you see that all of this mental, emotional f- flailing, this self-flagellation, this fear, you see, you see all of these things for the first time in a completely different view because you realize that all that you went through, you couldn't avoid it. But that it is having gone through it that brings you to the time where you realize that there's nothing to avoid when it comes to your spiritual wish and what it brings to you. Nothing. It's all part of the path, Stanislav. You have to get to the point you are. And then it's punctuated by the realization that the very people that you want to love you, you do nothing but judge them all the time. The people from whom you demand or wish respect, you don't have respect for them. And it's impossible as you see that, it, you know they don't have respect for you. They want from you what you want from them. And you start to see this. And it isn't negative. It isn't, it isn't um, uh, ruining anything. It, it's reality. I live in a world where I believe that who I am and my self-worth is determined by the world that I'm a part of. And you gradually see that the world you're a part of can never bring you the peace you imagine. And so you have to go through this dark night. It's inevitable. Blessed are you who are reviled in my name. Why, why, Why would Christ bother to say something like that? He wasn't just talking about the people around the disciples. He was talking about all the disciples in the head of the disciples, all the things that they've been taught along the way that they're supposed to be and do. And then they can't do it anymore because another love has taken its place. And suddenly their own mind is torturing them, reviling them, telling them you're nothing, you're gonna go nowhere, look at you, you're an idiot because of whatever it is that you don't even know exists in the first place. And it talks and it talks and it talks and one day you just get Get tired of listening. And when that happens, you are you 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 have taken the next step, which is to put your feet down into another order of being, and then that will go through the iterations it does that's required of it. You must see for yourself. You mustn't believe me. But you're right there. Stay there. Good night, everybody. <laughs>